the theories was fermionic, okay? Because psi bar psi is as good a boson as phi bar psi. Okay? Uh, or between the free energy, which, which also doesn't give us any bosonic fermionic nature. So you might want a slightly more fine-tuned, some, 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 some math between psi and phi in some way. Now, you know, like we said, correlation functions of psi are not gauge invariant in general. Similarly with phi. But there is one limit of these correlation functions that is gauge invariant. And this limit is these correlators, when you take them to infinity, in a way tuned with the equations of motion, are also known as the S matrix. Okay? So the particular limit of correlators which puts the correlation functions on shell, okay, <coughs> namely the S matrix, is gauge invariant even though these, these correlation functions are not. So it seems like uh, one admittedly weak, but one version of a bosonization formula that actually tells you about how the fermions are linked to the bosons in some way would be to try to understand the relationship between the scattering matrices in the two sides of the field. Okay? So this is one motivation to try to understand scattering in these theories. Another motivation is that, you know, this is a theory uh, in which we can do all calculations completely, calculations, uh, um, uh, calculations uh, to all orders in a coupling. So there's every interesting observable that you can compute should be computed to all orders in a coupling, just to see if there's any, any surprises. Okay? So motivated by these two, these, motiv uh, these two motivations, I'm now, now going to try to, uh, now going to try to, uh, in both these theories, compute the S matrices. I'm going to try to compute the S matrices in 2 to 2 scattering. Uh, okay. Any questions or comments before we proceed? So I want to ask about the phase transition. Usually we understand the uh, confinement, free confinement phase transition uh, from running of the coupling. From what? From the running of the coupling. Running of the coupling. Uh, but in this case, it doesn't run. Right? Yeah. Now, this question you could have asked about n equals 4 in this theory as well. Okay? And let me remind you of the answer there. I'm reminded of the answer here there because this theory turns out to be a bit more complicated. So there's one more step. But let me address that question. Okay? Suppose you take n equals 4 Yangmus theory and put it on a three sphere. n equals 4 the Yangmus theory is a conformal theory. So on R3, uh, the free energy scales like t to the 4 at all temperatures. There's no phase transition. Okay? Um, however, on S3, there is a separate scale. Okay? So the free energy could be a non-trivial function of R times T. Okay. Now, at low temperatures, the free energy turns out to be just given by a gas of traces. And in particular, because the spectrum of traces is independent of N, the free energy is independent of N. On the other hand, at high temperatures, or equivalently fixed temperature and big size of the sphere, um, the theory basically doesn't know that it's on a sphere. So it behaves like R3, and there the, temp the free energy behaves like n squared times t to the 4. So because there are different powers of n, at least in the well, only in the large n limit, there's a precise order parameter, namely free energy divided by n squared, which is 0 in, at low enough temperatures, which we showed, yeah, and non-zero at high temperatures. So there's a phase transition. The phase transition is basically between a gas of singlets, which are the analog of QCD glue bonds, and a gas of gluons. That's why it's appropriate to call it a deep impact transition. Okay? But, but it only exists because of the artificial scale you put in the problem, namely the size of the sphere. Okay? And happens at a, at, at a temperature of order the radius of the sphere rather than lambda QCD, simply because there's no lambda QCD. Okay? Very similar story. Um, good. Uh, other questions or comments? Okay. So, so now what we're going to do is to try to compute these, these S matrices. Uh, and let me explain how. Let me start first with the bosonic theory. Okay? I'm going to try to compute the S matrices for 2 to 2 scattering. And um, as I... Um, okay. Now, let me use some terminology. Any object that transforms in the, fun, uh, in the fundamental of UN, I will call a particle. Any object that transforms in the anti-fundamental of UN, I call an anti-particle. Okay? So now there are 
basically three different scattering processes I could, could study. I could study particle particle going to particle particle. I could study particle antiparticle going to particle antiparticle. Or I could study antiparticle antiparticle going to antiparticle antiparticle. Now those of you who are uh, uh, used to doing traditional field theory calculations um, for scattering know that these three chat that usually speaking, these three processes are not independent of each other. Once you know any one of these, you can get all the others by crossing symmetry. Okay? But we're gonna find we're gonna encounter some issues with crossing symmetry in this in this in this theory. So I'm not gonna make any assumptions to start with. For me, all these processes are independent to start with. Of course, this and this are related by CPT. Okay, so they are not independent. But these two are treated as genuinely independent to start with. That's not how we started doing the calculation. Okay. Um, fine. Okay. So now let's look at the kinematics first in these two sectors separately. So let me look at particle, particle going to particle, particle. Of course, we've got an I and a J here, and an M and an N here. So you might think that, well, there are plenty of S matrices labeled by N to the four uh, functions. Yes? Are you working in the decompartment space? I'm working at zero temperature, OK, and on R2. So R2 is always in the decompact phase. Right? I, I mean, it's just zero temperature of the control. Of the, of the field. OK. But of course, the index dependences, the UN index dependences of these scattering amplitudes are largely governed by UN, uh, UN group theory. One way of thinking of this is that we want to make singlets out of these and the conjugates of these. OK? And one way of making these singlets is by coupling these into representations, coupling these into the conjugate representations, and fusing. OK? So there are two possible, there are index structures allowed to, uh, two, you know, since you can couple two fundamentals in, into two representations, the symmetric and the anti-symmetric representations. Associated with this, we've got some S matrix, which I'll call Associated with this, I've got an S matrix. So in the particle-particle sector, there are two functions of the four momenta that I have to discover. What about the particle-antiparticle scattering? OK? Now, for particle-antiparticle scattering, once again, I'll couple these two, couple these two at fields. OK? Here, once again, there are two representations. There's the singlet, and then there's the adjoint. OK? So in particle-antiparticle scattering, I've got S sing and S adjoint that I want to discuss. Now, the fact that we had two here and two here is, of course, not that they got the same number here, and that was not a coincidence. Because in each case, what we're trying to do is to take phi phi, phi bar, phi bar, and couple the singlets. We did it either by fusing the two phi's and the two phi bars, or fusing a phi and a phi bar and a phi and a phi bar. Um, the different ways of doing this are related by what I call six J symbols. OK? So um, if we were just interested in correlators, the relations between this and this and this and this would be given by six J symbols plus analytic continuation of if crossing symmetry was correct. OK? So this is just a different, these two things are a different basis for the space of group singlets. But this is convenient, this basis is convenient to analyze particle particle scattering. The space is convenient to analyze particle antiparticle scattering. Is this clear? So my goal is to compute these four functions. Okay? S singlet, sorry, S symmetric, S anti-symmetric, S singlet, and S adjoint. Okay. Fine. Now I remind you that in my last lecture. I reviewed what was known about these S matrices in the non-relativistic case. OK? That was just a calculation by arnold bohm scattering. And you remember that in the last lecture, we used the same kind of decomposition. We had representations of the particle and the exchange representation. And you remember that the scattering was, 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 was controlled by this effective phase, which was pi by k times Casimir of the 
fused representation minus Casimir of representation 1 minus Casimir of representation 2. Right, that, that played a, a key, key element in that, in that sketching. So, the first thing we're going to do before actually starting the calculation is to try to understand clearly what we should expect in the non random scheme. So all we have to do is to compute this object for the, the representation fuse, fusing choices at hand and find out what the, form, what the new is and put that in the formula we have for the last class, uh, we have from the last, last lecture. Okay, so let's do it now uh, in each of these cases. Suppose we take fundamental and fundamental goes to symmetric, or fundamental and fundamental goes to anti-symmetric. Okay, now some of you may know the following rule for quadratic Casimirs of UN, of SUN or UN theories in the large n limit. The rule is that the quadratic Casimir is simply equal to the number of boxes for quadratic Casimir for small representations. So representations where the number of boxes and the number of empty boxes is kept fixed as you take n to infinity. You know, so for instance, in this not notation, the adjoint has one empty box and one box. Okay? The rule is that the quadratic Casimir is simply a add n times the number of boxes plus number of empty boxes for such representations. Maybe n by 2. Okay, some constant number times n times number of boxes plus number of empty boxes. Okay? So let's use this rule for these cases. In this case, the number of boxes in this is 2. Number of boxes here is 1. Number of boxes here is 1 because we're scattering fundamental plus fundamental. So that's 1 plus 1 to give you either this or this. Number of boxes 2. So here you get n by k times 0. So for both these scattering processes, this effective phase in the large n limit, nu is equal to order 1 by n. Okay? In these two scattering processes, on the other hand, if we do the scattering of fundamental with anti-fundamental, that's once again 1 and 1 here. And if we get the adjoint here, once again that's 2. So 2 minus 1 and 1. So the adjoint, once again, has nu as order 1 by n actually turns out to be 1 by n squared. But anyway, 0 in the larger limit. Okay? Uh, 0. But for the singlet, number of boxes here is 1, number of boxes here is 1, or anti boxes here is 1, but number of boxes here is 0 because it's a singlet. Okay? So there for the singlet, nu turns out to be pi times lambda. I remind you, lambda is. Uh, Whenever I write k here, it should be a comma. Okay. Uh, I remind you, lambda was just n divided by lambda. Okay. So when you go through the formulas that I gave you in the last in the last lecture and put these these uh, uh, these results in, you find the following interesting result: scattering in the non-relativistic limit in these large n theories, large n fundamental theories, is trivial in three of the four channels. Okay, you get very trivial scattering matrices in three of the four channels in the non-relativistic limit. You get something non-trivial only in one of the four channels, then the particle-antiparticle scattering with singlet exchange. Okay. <coughs> now, um, now, now, you remember, you remember that we had this rule. Uh, now, I'm going to immediately give you a little bit of intuition before proceeding as to why this result uh, suggests, how it suggests, or uh, suggests something interesting for the duality between the fermionic and the bosonic theories. Okay? You remember that when we took a part one particle, you know, we exchanged, um, we exchanged particles. When those particles had an anionic phase, the, f the phase that they picked up effectively was e to the power i pi nu because of exchange. Okay? When you do this calculation carefully, nu turns out to be lambda. I might have got some factors of two wrong. But nu turns out to be lambda. So 
in the adjoint channel, when you exchange two of your objects, let's say the, the bosonic objects, you pick up, they pick up a phase e to the power i phi lambda b. In the fermionic channel, what do you get? You pick up a factor of minus one because they're fermions, times e to the pi pi lambda f. Okay? So you get minus one times e to the pi pi lambda f. And then writing minus one as e to the power minus i pi. Okay. Basically, you see that these two phases are the same, provided lambda b is equal to one minus lambda f. Okay. So this gives you a suggested interpretation for this duality. What's going on here is that at least in this in this particular channel where, some, where you've got a, something non-trivial and at least in the non-relativistic limit. Okay? What's going on here is that when you interchange two of the bosons, they don't behave like bosons anymore. They behave like anions with a particular phase. When you interchange the fermions, they also behave like anions. But if you want the effective anionic phase to be the same for bosonic and fermionic exchange, this happens when mod lambda b is 1 minus mod, mod lambda f. So this gives you an interpretation of this formula. It's the formula, at least in this large end limit, and exchange, at least for singlet exchange where something non-trivial is going on. It's simply the statement that we're choosing the values of parameters so that both the bosons, as well as the fermions, in fact describe anions with the same anionic phase. Okay? Any questions or comments about this? Is there actually momentum exchange in the two particle scattering? Yeah, yes, yes. Moment, momentum exchange meaning? Between the two particles. Oh, yes. Uh, OK. It's not, but you're going to write on some formula. That I, I, I will explain. I will. Yeah. So this is just intuition. OK. Fine. Now, um, the last general thing I want to say the last general thing I, I want to say before, uh, before going to the calculation is about unitarity. Okay, the last general thing I want to say before going over to the calculation is about unitarity. So, I want to remind you that S, may, that S matrices in any consistent quantum process, just because probability is conserved, be an equation like S minus S. Well, t minus t dagger. <coughs> Unitarity equation. Okay. What's important is that the on the left hand side of this equation, okay, on the left hand side of this equation we've got stuff that's linear in t. And on the right hand side of the equation we've got stuff that's quadratic in t. Okay. What? <laughs> Look up the papers for this thing. <laughs> okay. Right. Um, okay. Now, uh, there is actually a very important point here. You see, if you look at, so for instance, in the bosonic theory, you remember that there was a term that was phi bar phi squared by n with a b form. Okay? The, the, this was one of the terms of the action. This 1 by n was simply engineered so that all terms in the action would be of order n. Phi bar phi is n. Phi bar phi n squared is n squared. Divide, that's why you have to divide by n. Yeah. So you want to take the large n limit before n fixed. Okay? So you see that pre-level scattering of four bosons. Uh, if you keep indices fixed for particular values of indices, because of this 1 over n here, you know, scales like 1 over n. And this is a general fact. If you just compute four point functions with fixed indices, phi, phi i, i1, i2, i3, i4, in the way we scaled things, you're going to get these scatterings uh, overall with a 1 over n. 
Now, you see, this 1 over n here would suggest that unitarity is a trivial equation in these larger theories, okay? Because the left-hand side would be 1 over n, and the right-hand side would be 1 over n squared. However, this is a dangerous, this is a dangerous uh, uh, game, because in the right-hand side, you have to sum over intermediate states. And it's possible you will get extra factors of n when you sum over intermediate states. Okay? Now, when you go through this, when you look at this a bit carefully, you find the following. You find that while the right-hand side of the unitarity equation in these three channels, in this channel, this channel, as well as adjoint exchange channel, is indeed 1 over n squared in normalization in which the left-hand side is 1 over n. In the singlet exchange channel, okay, the sum over n here compensates for the additional factor of 1 over n. So you get a non-trivial unitarity equation. And a unitarity equation which both sides scale in the same way as in 1 over n. Okay? So clearly in this whole process, there are three simple scattering matrices and one interesting. Okay? The singlet exchange has non-trivial unitarity integrations and it has non-trivial um, non-relativistic element. The other three are sort of a bit boring in, 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 in these ways. Moreover, this S matrix, you know, normally this unitarity relation here, when you cut here, you have to put all processes in, right? When you do, you may be doing 2 to 2 scattering on the left-hand side, but in this cut, you should include 2 to 4 scattering, 2 to 6 scattering, everything. What? No, no. T is some complex number, and its imaginary part is T. Right, but you are saying this uh, following argument. That yes. So in those, in these, in these three channels, where the right hand side is effectively zero, that the unitarity equation simply boils down to the statement that three is, uh, that T is pure imaginary, or if you put an I, is pure real. Okay, in in the appropriate. Okay, so it's a very trivial equation. Yes, the example is complex. Okay, uh, you say we have to be a bit careful about what this um, what this t uh, what the t dagger is. See, t dagger requires you to interchange initial and final particles along with taking complex conjugate, and you put the right factor of i. So in what I had yesterday, what you should do is compare s with s star of minus theta. Okay? Nonetheless, it is true that there is an imaginary part in the yesterday's amplitude, which is consistent with the fact that this unitarity equation okay, is non-trivial in the singlet channel. And yesterday's amplitude is the non-relativistic limit only of the singlet channel. Okay? So we are going to get something, an interesting unitarity equation, even in the non-relativistic limit. In fact, that's how Jackie really made clear that the delta function existed, by insisting on unitarity of the, the non-relativistic limit. OK, so it's a good point, but yeah. OK, um, okay I need to hurry a bit, so let's move on. So uh, um, right, so where were we? The last thing I wanted to say about unitarity, and then we'll get to something concrete, is that in the large n limit, however, Okay, it is easy to demonstrate that all contributions cutting in cut here, in which, for instance, you go from 2 to 4, are suppressed at 1 over n. Okay, uh, one way of seeing this for is, for instance, um, you know, it's just the usual large n counting. That uh, if you want an additional, additional particles in the middle, compared to a, uh, a diagram in which there are only two particles in the middle, you have to add an additional index loop. And every index loop uh, costs you an extra one by n. OK? So suppose you've got uh, some process like this, where you've got a lot of gauge boson exchange. So this is, uh, this is a two-particle exchange here, because the gauge bosons are not really particles. And then you add, you want four-particle exchange, you can do it by doing something like this. But that's an additional factor of one by n. OK? So the unitarity equation in this theory becomes a very simple unitarity equation. It's a closed nonlinear constraint on 2 to 2 scattering. 
Okay? So we've got a very strong bar of, of having a very strong consistency check for a formula. If we get the right formula, the answer has to obey a, a <coughs> cleanly obey a tight, wiggle-free, nonlinear equation, which of course hard to be. Okay? So that's nice. We've got a clear consistency check of any formula we produce. Okay, uh, good. Any other questions? Any questions or comments? Fine. So now let's get to the calculation. So what do we actually do? So are you going to write down that constraint equation explicitly? Or? Uh, I'm, it's, okay, no, I was not going to plan it. Yeah. Wait, would you like me to? Uh, I, yes. Okay, no, okay. This doesn't take so much time. No. It's just this. Okay. Um, since it's a, an equation in only one channel, it's just an equation on one function. Okay? So we've got one function, which is a function of the square root s and theta. Okay? And up to some numbers, which I won't get straight here, it's simply the equation that s of square root s and theta minus s star, this is probably t, t minus t star of uh, square root s and minus theta is equal to integral t square root s uh, theta minus alpha uh, t star square root s of probably minus alpha uh, d alpha. Okay, this is the, uh, the equation written down in the center of mass. Uh, and th there are some numbers here, there's a 16 pi square root s. There's some number here, which you could try to make. Okay, this is the structure of the equation. Notice, by the way, that it's a constraint on this thing as a function of, of theta. Okay? So it's actually very hard to satisfy this constraint. Because you produce some function of theta, you know, it's really got to work into a very complicated way. It's a non-linear equation. Is it possible to actually just classify the possible solutions based on the equation alone? Without okay. Uh, uh, yes, you can. But that gives you much more freedom than... Uh, um, you know, this actually, this equation is very similar to the kind of equations for unitarity that arise in quantum mechanics. Just because there's no particle production in quantum mechanics. So quantum mechanics auto automatically saturates unitarity into 2 2 scattering by itself. And uh, so people who study quantum mechanics have looked at this unitarity equation in great detail and classified the solutions of it. Uh, and the solutions are parametrized by uh, what are called, uh, uh, it's best to go into some sort of uh, um, e to the power im. It's got, it's got some name. Um, scattering in uh, some partial waves. And in each partial wave, you've got a, uh, you've, the, the, the uh, S matrix has to be a pure phase. Okay? Uh, that completely ca classifies solutions of this equation. But then that gives you an infinite number of free parameters. But, but, but would Lorentz invariance together with uh, analyticity, such an analytics requirement might put more constraints? Might put more constraints, plus the fact that the, uh, the amplitude should not grow too fast at infinite. Uh, at large moment. Yes, so this is a game I tried. Okay, I tried to completely find the S matrix with these constraints. I was not able to, but you know, with the right, uh, with the right extra input or the right, it's very plausible. Okay, yeah, it's very plausible. Okay, uh, other questions about it? Now you can of course word this whole equation in a very intimate way. Hmm. Uh, other questions or comments? Okay. So, now let, let me go on to tell you what we actually do. Okay. We want to cal calculate these S matrices, and we're doing it by very low technology way, just by summing Feynman diagrams. Okay. Now, in order to sum these Feynman diagrams, um, we adopt a particular gauge. This is a key technical device that's, that's useful in our problems. We adopt LIPO gauge. 